this is part of the jungle. Mm. So there's predominantly two encampments. This is one of them. The second one, which I don't know if Richard plans on going to, um, was relocated. So it used to be in this area and then they all moved within a span of like three months into a new area. For any reason. Um, yeah, Walmart was like, you need to get the fuck out. They were gonna like build something back there. And they ended up not doing it. <laughs> so they came and they cleaned all that up after the fire and then they decided to build a road. That's why this is so flat. This used to be like that. That's why this is so flat. So they started building a road. And then when they got to about over there, they noticed that every time they came back in the morning, their batteries were missing from their trucks and their cars. And they said, fuck this, we're not doing this. And they stopped building the road. So it comes to an abrupt end over there. And that is just a way it demonstrates how these populations tend to insert themselves into the civic life of the community. Richard! And Amber! And Erica! And propane! And soup! We get 130 meals. Uh, a weekly from Gola, which is one of the best restaurants in town. And with those 130 meals, we not only feed people that are returning, uh, returning citizens, but we feed anybody in, that we could reach that we know is suffering economic hardship, uh, food insecure, uh, or, or living in a vulnerable space. Uh, so we reach, uh, and we try to do it as a broader demographic as we can. So we go to single mothers, we go to the domestic uh, uh, shelter, domestic abuse shelter. We go to uh, Endeavor House, which is a house for formerly incarcerated people. We go behind staff, we go to the jungle, we go to West Village, and we've been very successful. We are almost at 7,000 meals since April. It's, it was, at, at, for the most part, a one-man <laughs> operation. Uh, Richard and um, himself and then Amber Tan joined me and she's been great she's been at it for like four months now and she got so inspired that she asked Cornell for a grant and she got a grant from Cornell from Engage Cornell and she's been using that money to provide propane during the winter months to this population and she has been the sole provider of propane. It costs $12 to fill up a 20 gallon tank. And she takes them every Friday and she's become quite the hit uh, among this vulnerable population. Homelessness can mean like a lot of different things. Like for, sometimes it's like for people who are trying to hide from the cops. And so they're like really just there for like a few nights until like the heat's off of them. For some people, it's also like rent's really fucking expensive, so they're just gonna live out here until they can find another place. Like, there's always an end goal, and the end goal is to like get out. There's also a few people who are like there for autonomy, independence from like whatever kind of like personal shit's going on in their lives. A lot of people also don't like homeless shelters too. It's overcrowded. They got beef with all the people. They got beef with the staff, and so that doesn't get to be. It's like that's hence why they're still in camp. Uh, they want soup, right? They want soup, yeah. Drop like three or four over there. Some bread. Thank you. I appreciate you. Yeah, got some bread too, sir. Give them one of those bags. Of right? soup yeah. right here. It's good soup. Well, you got spoons? You got spoons? Thank you. Yeah. We'll give you some band-aids and alcohol pads. Right, actually, the pads are easy too. I'm going to put this over there. Thank you. Thanks. The, the, the fresh food is an absolute necessity to your own self-dignity, right? Think about the folks, your, your mindset, if you're digging through trash cans because you're homeless and you're eating, how are you thinking about yourself? What are you losing, right? Um, so we're not just talking about the physical health from the nutrition. We're also talking about the psychological health of the folks 
uh, and what they're consuming, right? It's you, you are what you eat. So if you're eating trash, your system is trash. You can't, you can't separate yourself from the way that you're living uh, because you're trapped in it by the things that you're consuming. Um, and if we're gonna change this system so that folks are actually um, healing while they're inside of jail and then, and then we're providing a mechanism by providing healthy food for them to heal while they're outside, uh, that's gonna be a huge, uh, make a huge difference, I think, in the numbers of folks who go into incarceration, leave incarceration and never go back. And she's beautiful. And they're all beautiful. They're all beautiful in their own way. But their the histories of trauma, the histories of addictions, the history of mental health illness, of abuse, uh, paints the picture that's, that we see before our eyes. And that, you know, that's already described with a certain no good, you know? No goodness. Our human bodies are inscribed with certain narratives and how those narratives play on those bodies defines how the person is, the person's lived experience in the social, political, and economic life of the community. So for example, a black person is perceived as more violent, less educated, and so it happens across the spectrum. So it happens across with women too, right? Mm -hmm. How we see women and we pay them less. Or how we see a homeless person and we want to reach in our pockets and give them a sandwich. Right? Assuming that a sandwich is what's needed to save this person's life. And, and, and in a broader sense, what we're talking about here is how the discursive powers, uh, the social uh, institutions, the, the churches, the politics, even the even Ithaca's idea of a progressive, forward-thinking community allows these places to exist, or this racism to exist with black bodies, or, or the jungle to exist for Caucasians, you know what I mean? The encampments is so, I remember when I first came out, because I was surprised that there was a lot, of, there were, I mean, kind of, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of white people. Um, and a lot of it is intergenerational. Like you have people who are there and they have kids there and same cycle of like homelessness, which I think is I'm like, dang, like that, like, it just means like they've been there for a long time. And it's just like something that Ithaca city, like A refuses to address and not acknowledge or be like actively, like they actively like do shitty things there all the time, like raids and take a bunch of shit. Black people don't go to the encampments. The homeless people that are black, I think because of cultural reasons, uh, do not go to the jungle. They don't do jungle sleeping. They, they go to the shelter or they'll sleep in their family's couch or on a porch somewhere, but they won't be. So the demographics of, of, of Ithaca it could, be, it could be discerned by these spaces. Why does the bus stop running up to West Village at 6 o'clock at night? And to and to uh, Cayuga Heights at two o'clock in the morning. You see how you exclude a population from the civic and political life of the community by just not affording them transportation. So we have six percent of the population in Tompkins County is black, right? They make up if you if you was to go to the mobile patrol app and look at the population of the Tompkins County Jail, you're going to see there's always like 35, 40 people there. And 18 to 20 of them is black. So they make up 50% of the population of the local jail, despite being 6% of the population of the county. Then if you go to the shelter, they make over 55% of the population of the shelter. And then you go to the Baddest Women's Shelter. And it's almost 80% black. Then if you go, and this is something, this is anecdotal, this part here. And we did a small survey sampling like 270 landlords and see how many of them were filing for eviction notice on their tenants. And it was something like 70% of them are doing that. That's when the moratorium is lifted out of 270. And I'm willing to bet that it's gonna be disproportionately people from West Village and Chestnut and Southside, you know, which is majority of black people. And uh, as the minority people, and um, so it goes across the line. So, so how the environment and 
the ecology and the pandemic, these intersection athletes play in determining uh, who's impacted and why. Uh, the data just clearly shows <laughs> that there's a problem. And the college and university scene, um, you know, we have a concentration of colleges and universities, and it has resulted in, um, you know, extreme gentrification, uh, you know, on a large scale. It is so much more lucrative for landlords to, you know, turn single homes into, you know, multi residential units and um, and charge rent, you know, for for you know, college students and their families that can afford those prices. There's such a long section eight waiting list because of the lack of housing, affordable housing um, in the community. And there was, you know, it was known that there were many, um, you know, single mothers with children who were opting to exchange sexual favors themselves with landlords in order to keep their children safe because the temporary housing that was offered and available in Tompkins County um, was known to be unsafe. Came as such a shock and a surprise um, to many people living in Ithaca who know Ithaca as a safe and progressive home but not for everyone. Those um, segregated populations on the outskirts were very different if you were here 20 years ago, maybe 20, 30 years ago, you had more of a diversity of folks living in a downtown area. Uh, whereas now um, in a downtown area it's more um, students, uh, more college folks, than the folks who were living downtown got displaced into these other areas. Um, and then not to mention the economic situation where there were, uh, I guess there was a gun factory that was employing a substantial number of uh, African-Americans who could then uh, support themselves living in a downtown area. Whereas uh, now, you know, there's nothing really, I guess I'm just speaking to uh, the displacement and the movement of folks, uh, uh, which kind of leads to a lot of folks being in need. Um, I guess you could call that environmental racism <laughs> um, of, 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 of uh, pushing, having people getting pushed out. Um, um, but yeah, that, that, I think that's, that requires a deep dissection there. I set out thinking, I set out with that question. This is my question of my life. What, how could a place like a jungle that you hear the word jungle, you know conceptually what it is, exists in a place like Ithaca that has the self-image as an aggressive form of thinking liberal community. And this was the paradox. So this paradox led me to different intersectionalities. And I'm concluding my ethnography now, and it turns out that Ithaca doesn't sustain the jungle as much as the jungle sustains Ithaca. The jungle has been around for 40 years now. And uh, it's part of the Ithaca's history. And the institutions and the jobs and the organizations and, and the progressiveness that Ithaca imagines itself to be is in large part due to the existence of the jungle. If the jungle was to cease to exist tomorrow, there will be thousands of jobs lost in Ithaca. Thousands of organizations will have to close their doors. That it is the jungle that sustains it. The jungle must exist in order for it to be what it is. This, uh, what is it, multiplicity, right, of, 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 of a reality here um, that says that we're one thing, but then when you look, when you dig under the surface, you see a, another reality if you're looking through the lens of specific groups of people. Um. It's certainly not the solution, but to a seed of hope and healthy food for all um, at that at that conference said, you know, we can't 
we're not in a position, we don't have resources, we're not, you know, we're not the right stakeholder um, to tackle the housing problem directly, but it's all interconnected. You know, if, if someone can't afford a safe place to live, then they're likely also struggling to afford healthy food. And so we made a commitment, a pledge that day to turn no single mother with a young child away um, and that we would guarantee a CSA share for any single parent with a child, a young child um, who wanted one. And I later learned that that made Ithaca the first city in the United States to guarantee uh, you know, a single parent with a young child living in poverty with access to fresh produce. I love Ithaca for the fact that it sees itself as a very progressive um, community because it identifies itself as such so I can push the limits on that progressive identity, um, that highest ideal um, without it you wouldn't have the work um, that we have in this community around reentry, around these food systems. Even when you look at uh, the reimagining policing initiative that's happening in this community, um, we're touted as one of the best in the country in terms of how we want to reformulate things, but we are still very, very far behind from where uh, humanity or civilization should be. Like that's one of the biggest things of like why I continue to work for Richard and like why I wanted to work with Richard is because it's like it's by the community for the community. All right, good, good. And uh, if you need anything, you know what to do, right? Yeah. Flash the Batman sign on the sky. <laughs> and I show up, lady. Oh, you don't know about that? No. All right, I don't know about that either. Oh my God. Oh my All right, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Oh.